Um, I had distributed a chapter uh, for you guys to read that contains a tremendous amount of information about pediatric uveitis. I think it's probably the most comprehensive thing on pediatric uveitis that's, been, that's out there, and it's you know recently published in uh, Dr. Hartman's book. Okay, so pediatric uveitis is not uveitis light. Okay, um, it is it has inherent challenges to this population, both diagnostic management and therapeutic. So from your reading, what are some of these diagnostic challenges, you know, that we face in patients with UVIs, uh, with pediatric UVIs in kids? They're hard to examine. Okay, anything else? They won't tell you their symptoms. Right. They really don't have symptoms. They may not have symptoms, exactly. Family anything else? The classic treatment modalities like steroids have a lot of side effects. Right. Um, what about um, their uh, diagnosis? What about the, the representation of diseases? We hit on the first one. Okay, history review, systems, complete exams, hard to obtain. They may not tell you. If you typically get that from the kid, uh, from the parents. The differential diagnosis in children varies with age, right? So you have an overrepresentation of, uh, of infectious diseases. There are pediatric specific masquerades. Can you name one? Okay. Uh, unique endogenous syndromes. Can you name one? It has juvenile in it. JIA. JIA, yeah, okay. Um, and how about atypical presentations of familiar disease entities in adults? Sarcoid, exactly, right. Then the choice and interpretation of laboratory tests may vary, right? So what test is classically elevated in kids? ACE. ACE, right. So management challenges. So the disease itself, right, is hard to manage. And why is that? I think like what Abigail said. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It, there, it's insidious, bilateral, it's asymptomatic. Frequent development of complications, okay? Presentations with established pathology we know is a risk factor for the development of more pathology and probably is, is you know, graphic testimony to screening failure. And then, of course, there's the unique risk of amblyopia in kids, right? So cataract is a big deal in children, okay? And we want to try to avoid that. What about the therapeutic challenges? You know, what do we use? What's the first line of treatment in uveitis? Steroids. steroids. What about systemic steroids in children? Yeah. Right, so you want to limit systemic steroids in children. Why is that? Because cataracts growth retardation. Okay, ocular complications. What else? What about systemic steroids? Why would you want to limit systemic steroids in kids? Growth retardation. Growth retardation. Yeah, sorry, I have hearing retardation. <laughs> okay, so we have the, um, you know, a corticosteroid, uh, uh, systemic and ocular side effects. And then there's therapeutic timidity with respect to using, you know, uh, uh, nostril immunomodulation in, uh, in kids uh, by many practitioners. And what else about kids if you take them to the operating room? What's the, is there something special about surgery in children? What's that? Anesthesia risk. Anesthesia risk? Their capsule's hard to okay. tear. What, what about inflammation? <laughs> they get a lot of inflammation. Yeah, so they have, you know, exuberant inflammatory responses, right? And then uh, there are inherent complications associated with certain diseases like JIA. Okay, epidemiology, I don't expect you to know numbers. Um, you know, I just put this up there. It's in the chapter and all that kind of stuff. But, but generally speaking, pediatric uveitis is more or less common than adult uveitis. Less common. Less, less common, about, how, about fourfold less common in terms of the incidence and the prevalence. But the thing is that it occurs in young kids. It's chronic. It's insidious. It's a long time, and it may actually, you know, represent significant morbidity for children, right? So um, it represents about, you know, between, I mean, that's a large range, right? It depends on where you're sampling. 2.2 to 21% of you guys in church here at care setting. 
Okay, what about the anatomic distribution of uveitis? Okay, so in a tertiary care setting, what's the, what do you think are the two most common uh, anatomic distributions of uveitis? Anterior. What's that? Anterior uveitis. And? No, actually. So anterior and intermediate. Okay, not that it's anterior and intermediate, and then posterior and pan uveitis. So we, you know, there is range associated with that. How about in, you know, if you're in general practice, what are you going to see mostly, right? Anterior, anterior uveitis, right? <clears throat> Obviously, it's re, uh, it's uh, influenced by referral bias and geography. Uh, what are the most common? What's the most common diagnosis in uveitis? Hyoiditis. What's the most common diagnosis? That's an anatomic location, right? Idiopathic. Right? Huh? Idiopathic. Idiopathic, right? Because we're idiots, right? And, and, or as the, as the nomenclature says now, undifferentiated. Okay, so it doesn't sound so bad. And then JIA would be second, pars planitis, and then the most common infectious is toxoplasmosis. Okay, structural complications. Name, name some structural complications that you might see in, in a kid that presents with uveitis. PAS. What? PAS. PAS? Cataract. Cataract. How about with chronic, how about on the cornea with chronic disease? Band keratopathy. What can blind children? Cataract. Cataract? I mean, blind. You can fix a cataract, right? But you can't fix an optic nerve, right? Okay, so glaucoma is a, is a big problem, right? Hypotony, macular scar. And so, how do you think that these structural complications are related to visual outcome? So, directly related to the duration of uveitis. Infectious etiologies are poor prognostic indicators and posterior pan uveitis. So they are associated with a worse, with more complications and worse visual outcome. Visual impairment is not trivial in children. You know, 15% in five years, uh, you know, uh, uh, visual impairment and severe visual loss varies, but is significant. The differential diagnosis of uveitis in children, okay, it's, I, I encourage you to just think in, in anatomic categories, right? Uh, so let's just do that. So non-infectious uveitis, anterior uveitis, what is the most common entity do you think it will come to your mind if a kid walks into your clinic? JIA. JIA, right, okay. Then there's also others, you know, that we'll discuss, okay, that are listed there. Okay, intermediate pan UVS, as we uh, discussed <coughs> earlier, posterior UVS, including these entities, sarcoid, and CP, and they're less common, but they do happen. So infectious uveitis, anterior, what is the most common infectious anterior uveitis in adults and in children? Herpes. Herpes, Herpes right, exactly. Okay, but you know, you can also see, you know, Fuchs and post infectious autoimmune syndromes okay, in children and post-vaccination syndromes. Posterior uveitis, right, the congenital torches, which we'll discuss a little bit more detail. And then, of course, other uh, infectious diseases that we will also discuss, like Bartonella and hematoid-associated disease, depending upon where you live, Lyme, and alpha minus and TB. And then, of course, masquerade syndromes are critically important. Think about and recognize the children, and we can, we'll discuss some of those just list them, but I think that Cole, you hit on uh, most of them. The most important being RB. What else do kids get? What systemic disease do kids get that sometimes presents in their eye? Leukemia. Leukemia, right. Okay, um, I think it is useful actually also to think about the differential diagnosis at the age of presentation, okay? because um, you know, certain things will be more common uh, at the age. So infants, what do, you, what do you think about in infants? What group of uh, diseases would you think about in infants? Torches. Torches, exactly. What's this thing? What do you think? Describe what you see, Marshall. Um, so you see some uh, hyperpigmented changes more in the mid periphery. Um, they have somewhat of a bone spicule like pattern. Um, yeah. What could this be? 
Um, it could be like um, a post-infectious uh, thing like rubella or... Right, exactly. Say the child's dead. This is rubella, okay? So the most common, you know, torture is toxoplasmosis. Others, we'll talk about some of the others, okay, which you probably wouldn't think of a little later. Rubella, CMV, HSV, and congenital syphilis. Um, what about um, children uh, between two and 10 years of age? What would be probably the most common presenting diagnosis here? JAA. Hmm? JAA. JAA, yeah. Okay, white, quiet, eye, right? Okay, then of course you have all these other infectious and uh, neoplastic things to think about. Um, just, you know, you're thinking of like the top hits, right? So the, I know there are lists, but they're useful, right? To, to have in your mind, okay? Then adolescence, is it, is it gonna be a lot different than adults? Probably not a lot different than adults. So Toxo, you know, with the usual <coughs> presentation, intermediate pan UVIS, you can see HLA-B27 associated disease. You can also see that as a subtype of JIA, which we can talk about. And then uh, these other infectious and neoplastic diseases. Okay, so let's start out with a case, okay? This is a long, complicated case of a kid <laughs> that I met when I first got here that I saw about six months ago, um, unfortunately. Anyhow, he's uh, lost to follow up, many social problems, but an interesting case nevertheless. Uh, remember that we saw this kid in October uh, or August of 2003, but he presented to pediatric rheumatology in 2002 for initial evaluation and was diagnosed with arthritis first, okay, and placed on 10 milligrams of oral methotrexate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so Damien comes in August 25th. He's got an ongoing leg pain. He's placed on a non steroidal and methotrexate. Visual acuity is 20 20. He's got some. Uh, inflammation in both eyes, okay? Not uncommon in patients uh, with good vision, right? So what do we do for this guy? Pred forte every two hours and cyclopentylate. Anything else you might consider doing? So he's on methotrexate, right? 10 milligrams. Because, you know, don't be shy, I don't know right, wrong answer. What, what might you think about doing systemically? So up on the uh, methotrexate. Yeah. Absolutely, so remember, he's three years old, right? So there's not a lot of room to move, okay, because it's, a, it's based on weight, right? So we increased his methotrexate to 15 milligrams, and he was on oral, okay, because he doesn't want to take shots at the age of three. Or his mother is incapable, actually, of giving him shots, which is really a problem. Okay, so, you're familiar with the treatment paradigm, we'll kind of review it again, but basically, steroids put out the fire, low threshold for immunomodulation uh, in patients that present with chronic disease, uh, established uh, complications uh, with anti-metabolites, um, and then moving on to biological therapy, second line therapy. Sometimes we might use, in some children, an oral steroid bridge for, uh, for in the short term, okay? So we increase this methotrexate to 15 milligrams, um, and, I'm sorry, and uh, for a year, he does okay, and he has these kind of like minor little flare-ups, you know, that are about 0 0.5 cells, 0.5 cells on 15 milligrams. Not enough, in our judgment, to increase his uh, modulation given the fact that he had 20-20 vision. I just want to call your attention to a little bit of a controversial issue, uh, and that is there is evidence uh, uh, out of uh, Hopkins uh, that the risk of cataract development is lower, is, is pretty much close to zero on chronic topical corticosteroids if it's less than, less than or equal to three times a day. This is a little bit of a dangerous recommendation, okay, uh, in that uh, it, uh, it is, you, it is intended to be a suppressive dose to keep a child quiet, not to initially treat people with steroids to keep on steroids forever, because we know that those children uh, can develop cataract and certainly ocular hypertension. Okay, so 
So this has nothing to do with popular hypertension. But, let, but for kids, there are some <coughs> kids that have, you know, less than one plus cell, okay, that really, that require maybe BID uh, steroids in order to keep them quiet, that are on immunomodulation. And that 60% of these patients will require additional medication. Okay? So then, about a year later, he presents, okay, with uh, another flare-up in his left eye. So this is one plus cell and KP, so it's significant inflammation. He's got, also got systemic arthritis flare with synovial thickening in his knees. So what are we gonna do for him now? Is he still on methotrexate? Still on methotrexate. 15. 15. <coughs> and he's taking it orally. It's just unilateral flare, and I would consider it topical again for the, he's not taking any topical now. He's, he's got a unilateral flare, but he's got arthritis too, right? Yeah. So we're going to treat his topical steroid, his topical inflammation, right? We're going to switch him to subcutaneous methotrexate. Why will we? Be, why would we do that? Well, he's a little older now. He can actually give it to him himself. But why is subcutaneous methotrexate better than oral methotrexate? Absorption is better. More bioavailable. Number one. So it's, number two, it may be associated with fewer side effects, but. That may or may not be true because there's a tremendous kind of psychological thing that goes on with injecting things. Just like you know, when people get their blood drawn, the big burly guy that comes in who's a weightlifter on, you know, that chews up steroids all day long is the guy that faints when he you know, gets his blood drawn. Anyway, what else do we want to do for him? Anti-TNF. What's that? Would you want to advance his therapy at this point in time? And what would you advance his therapy to? Mm -hmm. A TNF inhibitor, maybe? Okay. What would you choose? Okay, so remember, this is uh, 2007. Okay. It's a speaker. Oh, it's not. And he's not. Ever. So, what would you choose? Cross hop on. So, we chose. Method, we chose infliximab, okay? And we chose infliximab because it, he, he has to go get an infusion, okay? We know that he's gonna get it if he goes to the infusion center. So it, it, it increases adherence, okay? And plus you have a little bit more flexibility with, in terms of the dosing, okay? And uh, in terms of, you know, we can start him at five or 10 milligrams per kilogram and go up to 20. And then we can vary the interval and then we also pulse him with a little oral steroids, okay, uh, to help with his knee and, uh, and hip pain. I didn't prescribe that for him, but it doesn't matter, okay, to help with his knee pain. So if he does okay, then uh, about a year and a half later, he comes in having, a, having been quiet for about a year and a half. <coughs> the technology has extended his infliximab interval. He's on methotrexate at a fairly low dose. Um, and no optic inflammation. So why do we keep patients on infliximab on low doses of methotrexate? Because it can cause lupus. Okay, it's really, really uncommon that lupus is, uh, that lupus is, but what it, that is true, that lupus can occur, but it's not so much to prevent the formation of lupus, but what kind of a molecule is infliximab? It's a chimeric molecule, right? So not human. Okay. So, what other purpose would methotrexate serve? Prevent antibodies. Exactly, which might diminish the activity of the molecule. Okay. Plus, it also serves, as we will see in the Sycamore trial, as synergy in terms of you know efficacy for the drug. So he was switched to adalimumab for convenience. Okay, he thought he was doing doing pretty well. You know, we can give it to him subcutaneously at home. And uh, he was on a short course of prednisone, and he was kept on methotrexate. So adalimumab and methotrexate. Okay. In November, he uh, 
about a year later, he comes in with continued joint involvement, methotrexate and adalimumab, and he's got a significant flare in his left eye, okay? So what are we gonna do now? Well, there are a couple of other, you know, third line options, not many available to us at that point in time. One was very hot, uh, hot one was a kind of a, there were some publications that, that seemed to show the efficacy. Um, we started Durazol, which I rarely do actually in kids because of the hypertensive effects of Durazol. But he needed, you know, uh, some immediate uh, quelling of this inflammation in the anterior chamber. And we uh, discontinued Humira and started a, a Batacept, okay? So, Why not go back to what had been working? Good question. Um, well, you'll see. I thought uh, we tried something new because we thought that maybe a Batacept might be good for his joints because he continue, had continued joint involvement here. And uh, there were reports that showed that this was good for both the eye and uh, you know, and the joints. Okay, so we started on Arencia, which is a you know fusion protein. Okay, uh, which has a, it's which is inter it has a very interesting mechanism of action, which you should look up. It's kind of like works on the checkpoint inhibitor uh, mechanism. Okay, so we started him on that. Then he came in in March. Low-grade inflammation, persistent arthritis. He was declared a Batacept failure. So the literature, uh, subsequent literature on Batacept was not so compelling. You know, I mean, no randomized controlled clinical trial. So uh, we was declared an Batacept failure. Plan. Back. Go back to what worked. <laughs> right. That's exactly what we did. Okay. So. We switched it back to infliximab every four weeks, loaded him up with higher dose of methotrexate and topical prednisone with a taper. Okay. This seemed to do the trick. Okay. So he was quiescent, uveitis and arthritis. He <laughs> slowly extended his um, uh, infliximab to every six weeks and reduces methotrexate dose. So the idea is if he's on infliximab and he's quiet, his joints are good, his eyes are fine, to lower the dose of methotrexate, you could go down to 7.5 milligrams of methotrexate to maintain protection against an anti-chimeric antibody. Okay. So at his last uh, exam, that's this is not quite his last exam, but this is in 2016, he actually had been doing great. This, he had, there are many social issues with this kid, and he showed up on fire again about six months ago. Hang on. All right, a little didactic stuff about JIA, okay? All right, JIA, okay, JRA, JCA, what is all this, right? It depends on the classification system that you use to, to classify it. We use the ILAR, the International League Against Rheumatism, uh, the, for the JIA classification rather than the, the, than the uh, ACR. Uh, it is the most common form of childhood arthritis, okay, and is the most common systemic association with the erosophytes. You all know that, right? Okay. What are the risks for the development of uveitis in JIA? This is a board question, okay? <coughs> What are the risks? Okay, let's just talk about JIA. There, what, what type of JIA is, represents the greatest risk? Being only very young, ANA positive, and POSI participants. I just heard some mumbling, that's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> what type, yeah, what so subtype of JIA? Oligoarticular, okay? What is oligoarticular JIA? Anybody? Four or fewer joints, exactly. What's extended, anyway, for the rheumatologists in the room? Okay. They start out at four or fewer, right? And then they have more than four. Okay. So the JIA subtype is, is very important. Oligoarticular is associated with, you know, 10 to 30% risk 
the, these are the other subtypes of JIA within the um, ILAR, okay? There's rheumatoid uh, factor negative polyarthritis, positive polyarthritis, <coughs> psoriatic arthritis, uh, encephalitis associated related disease, which is behaves like HLA B27 associated disease with acute pyritis identified type. So oligoarticular is number one, but these others are also uh, entities to consider and can be very difficult to treat, particularly psoriatic arthritis. What other factors? Okay, JAA subtype, so what else? What tests do we always get? ANA. ANA. Okay, positivity is a risk factor, right? All right. What else? Young age. Young age at onset. What else? Duration. Duration. Uh, okay. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by duration. So like the duration of the disease. Or I guess that's follow-up, isn't that? Okay, what about sex? Females. Okay, female sex. Younger age of onset. It, I think what maybe you mean by duration, but younger age of onset. So, you know, average age of onset is about four years of age. And uh, so younger age of onset, female sex. Okay, so those are, those are the risk factors. Those are board questions. And there is HLA, so uh, genetic association. Okay, just so for, for board type purposes. Okay. Clinical features, I think you all probably know these. I'm just going to blow through this. At presentation, they're not going to tell you they have arthritis, iritis. That's why we screen them. Okay. So asymptomatic bilateral non-granulum uveitis, sometimes presenting with um, complications. Peak onset is between six months and four years of age. So most of them follow the onset of arthritis. So most of them come in, they're referred by rheumatology. Can you please screen this patient for iritis? But there are about 10% of them that you may perceive the onset of arthritis. These are the kids that are really in trouble, okay? So they enter the healthcare system late. These are the kids that come in, you know, with complications. And so you're chasing, you're behind the eight ball already, okay? Uh, the thing that is important to note is that the systemic and ocular inflammatory components are uh, not synchronous with one another. And that's important to tell parents as well. So. You know, um, I'm treating your kid with quiescent joint disease with, we're increasing their immunomodulation because their iritis is bad, but, uh, but there's a systemic disease, okay? So they can be independent of one another. Okay, predictors of a poor visual prognosis. This seems like common sense, okay? But uh, in the site study, which was a, a large retrospective study of JIA, you know, predictors of poor visual outcome were, what do you think would be number one? I mean, a predictor of poor visual outcome. Poor visual activity at presentation. Okay. What else? Special inflammation. Okay. Inflammation. Active inflammation, right? So they come in with one plus cell for a year. All right? The presence of posterior sneakia, I, I think was mentioned. Uh, and then in the site site, at least prior to intraocular <coughs> surgery, all of which I believe that that prior intraocular surgery would represent, you know, uh, would be a proxy marker for disease severity, right? Okay, onset of uveitis before, we mentioned this before, the diagnosis of arthritis, 10%, right? Uh, shorter interval from the onset of arthritis to uveitis, and at least one study, ma males did worse uh, than Um, there is, are screening recommendations that uh, you know you should be familiar with, and it's based on ANA positivity and the type of arthritis that you have. So oligoarticular disease that's ANA positive is screened every three months, um, uh, up until the age of you know six six years, and then it's extended. But we see these patients frequently anyway because they're on immunomodulation, okay? and maybe these screening guidelines are not screened. Um, ocular complications, we've kind of been through this, uh, band, posterior synechia, cataract, ocular hypertension, macular edema, ERM, and hypotony. So you don't want to see an eye like this, you know, first day. This is not good, right? 
So 60% of eyes present with an ocular, one ocular complication, and there's a, uh, uh, you know, instance of new ocular complications about 15% per year. That's pretty high. Okay, I think that um, you guys are quite familiar with this, and I'm going to go kind of for the sake of time and interest in terms of doing more kind of case stuff. But a therapeutic approach, we want to eliminate active inflammation, right? And we do this by whatever means possible, as Malcolm X would say. Um, and we use a step ladder approach using topical uh, steroids. Oral nonsteroidals are used not infrequently in kids with JIA, okay, uh, for their arthritis. And there are some people, at least my mentor, seem to believe that oral nonsteroidal inflammation was actually useful as a steroid sparing strategy. Subsequent, uh, I think, uh, Research has shown it's kind of a wash, a third, a third, a third. You know, some do better, some are the same, some do worse. Periocular uh, corticus, I, I mentioned using diphluprinid. I use it, but I use it with caution because um, it will hasten the development of cataract and is associated with elevation of drug pressure. Similarly, uh, periocular and intravitreal steroids, I use a little bit, I'm a little bit more cautious in children because they seem to have a more robust hypertensive response, okay? And it is a, a bit of a problem, you know, uh, when you, uh, you have to take the OR, uh, give them an injection, and if, it, if they have persistently elevated pressure, you know, uh, then you're, you may or may not be buying that surgery, which you would want to avoid doing in a kid. Brief uh, steroids for bridging therapy, and then a low threshold for steroid sparing immunomodulation, okay? So chronic inflammation, right? Presentation of established pathology would be indications for that. We've gone through this in our first lecture, you know, broad categories, the anti-metabolites, uh, T-cell uh, transduction inhibitors, calcineurin inhibitors, and alkylating agents, which are used very infrequently in children. And then methotrexate is the first line agent, okay, in kids. I just want to just call your attention to the fact that there was some very interesting work out of the Netherlands uh, that had to do with the um, chance of remission in patients with on methotrexate. So uh, a not unreasonable question for parents is, how long is my kid going to be on this medicine, right? Okay, so um, it's, it's hard to tell. Some of them are on this medicine for a long period of time. But the, a group from Netherlands showed that uh, longer uh, periods of disease quiescence, okay, longer time on methotrexate, minimum of three years, and older age at the time of withdrawal were associated with greater remission and less recurrence of disease. That's all I want to show about that. So with non-responders, we have alternative anti-metabolites, uh, you know, including mycophenolate and azathioprine. Um, sometimes one, uh, some, a child may respond to mycophenolate, but not azathioprine. Cyclosporin actually can be useful in children, and kids do tolerate greater doses of cyclosporin than adults and develop less hypertensive effects. And then, of course, there are the biological response modifiers, all of which are listed here. The most common ones that we use are infliximab and adalimumab, but there are others that have been shown to be good third-line agents, uh, such as uh, tocilizumab, uh, rituximab, and in certain cases, uh, you know, uh, for, for really weird diseases, you know, like muckle wells, uh, IL-1 inhibitors like that, et cetera. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna skip through this. Uh, you know that uh, adalimumab is approved for uveitis uh, in adults, right, for intermediate post-treatment pan-uveitis, but not anterior uveitis in adults. Okay. It is approved for, for many classes of arthritis in children, but not for anterior uveitis, believe it or not. Okay. But we use it as such. Okay. There was an important trial called the Sycamore trial in, in a randomized controlled clinical trial, a multi-centered study, which looked at adalimumab plus methotrexate versus methotrexate alone. Okay, and this showed uh, that there was a 
a significant delay time treatment failure with a combination rather than methotrexate alone. Okay, and that there were significant differences in the time to treat response with a combination, which supports the um, co common practice of using both of these drugs together. Okay, there were more side effects associated with the combination, but they seem to be tolerated. This trial was stopped early because of efficacy. Okay, so uh, we talked about some of the third line agents that are available to us. Um, about a step, not so much. Rituximab, you know, pretty, it has been used actually uh, successfully as a third line agent. Um, you can also change the, um, uh, you can change the uh, anti-TNF medication. So some, some children have responded to golimumab and, and uh, Simsia uh, when they have not uh, responded to uh, Humira and infliximab. Um, what about the outcomes? Well, I think there is some really good evidence in the literature, not prospective evidence, but site evidence from large uh, retrospective cohorts and single center uh, studies of JAA from Hopkins that show that there is a, uh, a significant uh, improvement in visual acuity and a reduction in ocular uh, in, uh, in, in uh, structural complications with the use of immunomodulation. So I think that it is a treatment paradigm. I think there's literature to support its use. Okay, JAA, probably the most important topic that we will discuss in this lecture, but really cool stuff that's coming here. Okay, so I mean, interesting cases. So here's a case of a four-year-old boy uh, with um, a, a red eye for two months. Parents didn't observe any changes in his vision. Okay, unremarkable review of systems, Cousin with pars planitis, normal development, 2030 vision, 2020 in the other eye, um, otherwise unremarkable. He did have inflammation in the front of his eye, and he had a mass in his inferior ankle. And that's what it looked like. Okay, so pretty much a unilateral presentation anteriorly. Do you appreciate that mass in the angle down there? And what else do we see? What's your CRC? Okay, and on B scan, this is UVM. Someone want to describe the angle there? Yeah, there's a mass on the angle. <laughs> okay. This is what the back of the eye looked like. Someone want to quickly describe that? It's a hazy view um, there are multiple round um, echo pigments or fusions that are both deep to the retina, maybe the choroid. Okay. Um, the looks a bit pale, but it might just be from exposure in the, in the haze, in the vitreous. Yeah. Left eye, similar findings, right? So the left eye didn't look so involved, but you're always looking the other eye, right? So this is a bilateral process, okay? Fluorescein angiogram, early and late. No big mysteries, right? Okay, a little blockage of some of those lesions and staining. Your observation of the nerve, I think, was correct. Okay, a little hyperemia of the optic nerve. Left eye, late. Similar findings of staining of this kind of coronal lesion, right? Um, ultrasound. Yeah, coronal thickening. thickening. What else in the choroid? Or the supracoronal space? There's a little lucent line there. Or hypoechoic. So there's a little fluid in the superchoral space. Right. OCT, right eye. See any problem connect here or any abnormality? Subround fluid. Left eye looks pretty good. Okay. Okay, so you know.
what stops. Because <laughs> <laughs> kids make you nervous, and you ordered pretty much uh, kitchen sink on him. Okay. The interesting, I, I think, I think in his exam was his white count, which was a little bit low. Path report. What? Path report. Yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Ramasumabarian actually was here in pediatrics at the time, biopsied that. I mean, that takes some uh, guts to do that. <laughs> uh, because, of course, you are worried about retinoblastoma, right? You don't want to biopsy that, okay? But the PATH report really showed an inflammatory process, right? Inflammation. Not granulomas, but inflammation. Okay? And the stains were negative for uh, bacterial malignancy. Benign inflammatory process. That's kind of like the go-to for pathology. You know? <laughs> Benign inflammatory process. It doesn't really, it helps us know that it's not an infectious process, okay? So we've got pan uveitis, multifocal cortical lesions, right eye greater than left eye. What are, you, what are we thinking about in this type of this kid? And a path report, that shows inflammation, okay. probably of recent onset. Okay. Just. So you're, th you're thinking along the right lines. So differential, early onset sarcoid, okay? Um, familial systemic juvenile granulomatosis, we'll talk about that a little bit. Alternately known as blau jabs syndrome, people want to name. Epstein-Barr virus is weird. I'm, I've seen a case of multifocal cortis associated with Epstein-Barr virus, <coughs> uh, but he was negative. Uh, and then common variable immunodeficiency syndrome can look very similar to uh, multifocal cortis and sarcoidosis. So plan, what are we gonna do for this guy? So I think that the chances of a neoplastic process are low. His herpes, human herpes simplex six virus titer was positive. That usually, okay, produces a necrotizing type of uh, retinitis in immunocompromised patients. But nevertheless, uh, it was positive, and you can see this in children, okay? I don't think this is necrotizing. Yeah, it's if everything is negative on the prior work of your you oral steroids. Okay. So that's how we felt. But we also, since we're paranoid, covered it with all that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Certain amount of prednisone and durazole, because you have inflammation, we were going to see him back quickly in atrophy. Okay, over two months, he did beautifully, okay? Resolution of the iris mass, flattening of the chordal lesions, tapering and valve tries to suppress this and this. And that's what his fundus looked like after about two weeks or three weeks. Okay, so we're on fluid resolve, vision 2020. Off prednisone for a month, he had a recurrence of AC cell in his right eye, okay? and a new red papular rash on his cheeks, his arms, and his legs, okay? Unfortunately, this was not biopsied. And uh, the thought was that the concurrence of the rash was supportive diagnosis for childhood sarcoidosis. Okay, so the plan here. What are we gonna do now? Recurrence inflammation. He's got badness in the front and the back of his eye. So we did. We started with started with IMT uh, with a steroid bridge. Okay, he was completely quiet with 2020. Two months later, his rash resolved. Plan at that time. Right. So continued and tapered. So we did do some genetic testing on this 
Charlie will talk about this a little bit later, but he was negative for a nod mutation. Uh, he did not have any family history of, uh, of uveitis. And a working diagnosis was juvenile sarcoidosis. So, is it odd that the biopsy wasn't granulomatous? So that's a very good question, I think, and I gave a lot of thought to that. I, I, I don't think it was odd that it wasn't, because it, you know, is in, in the iris, okay? It was uh, probably very, very new, probably fresh, and probably not enough time to form a granuloma. I, that, that's my thinking. Also, could it just be cells that had been, like, mobile in the, um, in the vitreous or in the um, anterior chamber that just kind of settled and collected but weren't organizing? I guess it could be, but it's a little unusual for it to be so focal. You know what I'm saying? You would expect more of a hypopion type of more diffuse uh, cellular debris. You know? Okay, so sarcoidosis, you know, is always cited, but it's really uncommon. Okay, in, in kids. Okay, there's there are two types in kids. There's early onset and there's late onset, and there are differences between them. Early onset usually is without pulmonary involvement. Okay, late onset is more like that with adults. Uh, I, and the current thinking is that there are probably two types of early onset. One is a sporadic variety, okay, which is, I think, what I'm sure our kid had. And the other one is associated with um, a uh, CARD-15 or NOD-2 mutation, which is something that is seen in familial juvenile granulomatosis syndrome. Yes. As well as sarcoidosis, or? Yeah, so there, there was a thinking that maybe juvenile sarcoidosis is type of, a type of blouse but it's sporadic. You know, it doesn't occur autosomal dominantly in families, as blouse does. But there are kids with juvenile sarcoid that have an odd mutation, okay? I, I can't re remember exactly the statistic, but I think it's over 50% of them, okay? Um, so we know that it's a granulomatous inflammation. It can cause, you know, uh, most common presentation is really anterior uveitis, but it can also cause an intermediate. It can do whatever it, help, it, it demo wants to, as we know before, right? It can occur in any segment of the eye. Lim uh, lacrimal gland involvement in children is less common than it is in adults. Um, chest X-ray may not be so helpful, you know, in a young child, but it would be in an older child, you know, for pulmonary involvement. And you'd want to try to biopsy, you know, non-pulmonary sites in the skin. So it was unfortunate that we didn't biopsy that, or unable to biopsy that child's skin. The differential diagnosis, JIA, obviously, right? Because sarcoidosis can produce arthritis, okay? And it can be differentiated because it's not granulomas. It's oligoarticular and ANA positive, right? And uh, then there are others, okay? Differences between JA and sarcoid, non-granulomas versus granulomas, anterior chiefly involvement in the JA versus anywhere in the eye and sarcoidosis, oligoarticular involvement as opposed to polyarticular involvement, and no pulmonary involvement in JA, whereas there can, you can have pulmonary involvement in older children and in some younger children with sarcoid. So when you hear hoofbeats, you think of, right, zebras, of course. And I think it's already been mentioned. Um, someone want to tell me what they're looking at here? It's a triad that comprises a syndrome that's been mentioned here. So, you got it. So, triad granulomatous dermatitis, uh, polyarthritis. There's a specific deformity of, of the hands. Do you know what that's called? Can okay, for a million dollars? It's called campylodactyly. It's a flexion deformity of the PIP joints that is characteristic of Blau syndrome. Anterior uveitis and, um, and posterior uveitis as well. Okay? So, 
Jug, Blau, Lobe, Grindinomatosis, Triad that we mentioned. Uh, it is linked to chromosome 16 with 100 phenotypic you know, correspondence with a non 2 mutation. It can produce a panhevitis and multifocal choroiditis, usually in children about four years of age, and development of complications is not uncommon. It can also produce some unusual complications, such as vasculopathy, and it needs to be distinguished from early onset in sarcoid and JIA. Okay, here's another case. Moving, switching gears. 10 year old kid referred with um, non granulomas, bilateral simultaneous non granulomas, uveitis with papillitis, uh, began after an illness with fever, vomiting, sore throat, optic nerve swelling, and AC inflammation. No past medical history. They were actually living in China. Their parents were ambassadors and living all over the world. They've been worked up uh, uh, in Singapore. Uh, and the workup was negative. Look at that workup. There's something missing from that workup. Okay, that's actually important. He did have elevated inflammatory markers, and he was a little bit anemic. He had recurrent episodes of fever, diarrhea, and lost seven pounds. We worked him up. His vision was 2040 and 2025. He had inflammation in both of, both of his eyes and uh, some cells in his vitreous and some papillitis, as you can see here, but no macular edema. Plan. What lab would you order on this kid? Syphilis labs. What is that? Syphilis labs. So we did order syphilis. We also ordered uh, all of these labs again. We <laughs> 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 here from China. We didn't want to, you know, bring them back from China. Okay. Initial treatment. We started them on durazole and atropine. We ordered beta-2 microglobulin, which was extremely elevated, okay? All right, so TINU is the diagnosis in this child, okay? And how do we know this was the diagnosis? Well, his creatinine was okay, but we sent him to Raul Nelson, who was a little bit alarmed by what he saw, and biopsy, okay? And so his renal biopsy actually proved this diagnosis with uh, predominance of lymphocytes uh, and plasma cells and focal necrosis of his uh, renal tubules. So TINU, all right, bilateral non-granulomous recurrent anterior uveitis associated with interstitial nephritis. It can happen before, during, or after an episode of uh, nephritis, so it's not, again, not concurrent. The median age of onset is about 15. But think about it in like a 30-year-old woman, particularly, there's a female predominance that presents with this. So there's a bimodal distribution to this. And uh, there is a genetic predisposition to developing it. We think, you know, it's cited maybe by some drug or microbe. <coughs> okay. The di definitive diagnosis is renal biopsy, but most often the diagnosis is not, we, children are not subjected to renal biopsy because not infrequently the nephritis will have subsided and the patient will have uveitis. So there are diagnostic criteria that have been uh, set up by a guy named Mandeville and beta-2 microglobulin, which is uh, excreted in the proximal tubule, is a very good screening uh, test for this disease. Okay, differential uh, listed here, you know, lupus sarcoid, GPA, Sjogren's post-streptococcal syndrome. Treatment. Well, you know, when this was first described, one got the impression that it was kind of a benign disease that, you know, oh, it goes away with topical steroids, but the problem is about 9%, and, and in our clinic, more than that, um, require, you know, more significant inflammation, okay, anti inflammatory medication with uh, IMT. Okay, so with our patient, 
He was treated with oral prednisone and Celsept. The beta-2 microglobulin decreased significantly with treatment, and he did better. Okay, so you're called for a consult over a primary children's hospital, and this is what you see. Someone want to describe these findings? There's a discriminating rash on the fingers and groin and uh, the mucous membranes in the mouth as well. And if you ask him to stick out his tongue, what might you see? Yeah. And so what, what are you thinking? Yeah, Kawasaki's disease, okay? Otherwise known as? Coalition disease. Hugo cutaneous. <laughs> it's like Hugo cutaneous lymphoma syndrome. Exactly, okay? So more common in Asian and South Pacific Islanders. Uncommon. Uh, it is a systemic vasculitis, okay? So it's a real disease, you know? Uh, uh, Medium-sized vessels. There are systemic manifestations. What is the systemic manifestation that you really need to worry about with this disease? Coronary degeneration. Exactly. Coronary uh, arteritis, vasculitis, exactly. Also meningeal encephalitis. Okay. What are, what are the odd, yes? Oh, I guess you're back. I was just gonna ask, like, is the, like, the conjunctivitis of the perilimbal sparing? Like, really yes, that's exactly right. right. So there you go. Okay, you anticipated my uh, <laughs> so ocular manifestations. What's the most common ocular manifestation, Marshall? Conjunctivitis with? Perilimbal <laughs> <laughs> 100%. <laughs> what else can you see? <laughs> <laughs> Anterior uveitis, optic disc swelling, dilated veins, amaurosis, central vein occlusion. What's the treatment? I don't really expect you to know this, but you wouldn't be initiating treatment, and neither would I, really. Okay, so IVIG really in the first ten days. Okay. Are the things being similar? Are there findings of this multi-system? Yeah, I'll give findings to be treated with topical steroids. Oh, my my question about was that was the perilimbal sparing really specific for? It is pretty okay. specific for it. Yeah. So just a word about bilateral simultaneous non-granulous anterior uveitis. Okay, it's pretty uncommon, but it should make you think of a couple of things. Okay, so uh, it usually has limited duration, and it usually there are recurrences. The etiology can we already have we already saw one of them. What other things might cause this? Drugs, okay, and uh, post-infectious phenomena, particularly uh, uh, streptococ, uh, you know, strep. Okay, TINU, Kawasaki's disease, HLA B27 rarely causes bilateral disease, but it can, so you know, test for it. Evaluation: We want to get serum ASO titers, B27 in urinary beta two. And why is post-streptococcal uveitis syndrome important to diagnose or to even think about? Okay, so it can cause bilateral anterior uveitis, right? But what else can it cause? Renal disease, right? Cardiac disease. So it's really a serious, serious problem, right? It requires a multidisciplinary approach. It occurs, you know, 50% of them under the age of 15, and post your involvement is seen over a third of patients. Okay, another case. Are we doing okay on time? Mm -hmm. Are we good? Still engaged? Yes. Okay, still mulling down? <laughs> yes. Okay. Here's an eight year old. This is a, actually an interesting case. Okay, real interesting. Eight-year-old white boy, okay, referred by an outside retina physician for a one-inch history of decreased vision in his right eye, okay? He was diagnosed with pan as most patients are, you know, they present, they come in with that diagnosis. 
and macular edema in his right eye. So we, and we came in on cut 14 on that. Negative review assistance. However, his past medical history was significant for a specific syndrome called periodic fevers, aphostomatitis, pharyngitis, cervical adenitis, which is characterized by recurrent fevers, oral ulcers, and it was controlled, and it was controlled with corticosteroids. So this is something in his past medical history. His family history was significant for a brother with ulcerative colitis and a father with MS. He had poor, you know, moderately reduced vision in his right eye, but his left eye looked pretty good. And on his examination, he had vitri vitritis, vitreous haze, hyperemic optic disc, and macular edema. I don't know if that projects that well, but it's on there. Peripherally, he had snow banking, inferior pars plana with overlying uh, collections of inflammatory material in his right eye and in his left eye, so it was really uh, symmetric and no neovascularization that we can see. Okay. So labs, we kind of got the usual labs and they were all negative. Diagnosis, does he have panuveitis? So what anatomic ca category of uveitis is this? Intermediate uveitis. Intermediate uveitis, right. And it is bilateral, right, but asymmetric. So intermediate uveitis with macular edema, possibly associated with PFA, PA, okay? Uh, we treated with Predforte with resolution of this macular edema and a septinon's catalog injection. And then nine months later, he presents with a vitreous hemorrhage in his right eye, okay? And the left eye showed neovascularization. Unfortunately, this is before, you know, really great wide view Okay, so what are we gonna do now with this guy? He had a vitreous hemorrhage in his right eye, young kid, and neovascularization in his left eye. Well, that's one possibility. Vitrectomy. Vitrectomy with an editor laser, maybe. What about his other eye? Good knee on that, right? You could give him VEGF, but, but while you're in the OR, you could also laser him. So that's what we did. Okay? We had a, and this is an interesting case for a couple of reasons. Uh, so we had a protective with endolaser in his right eye and peripheral laser in his left eye. He did great for two years off of all medications. Okay? Absolutely no inflammation at all. And he represents with a mild flare in his left eye and reduced vision in his left eye. Two plus cells in AC and uh, vitreous cell in haze. We wanted to treat him actually with, since he had no disease in his right eye and disease in his left eye with an intravitreal uh, therapy. Uh, he really didn't want to have anything to do with it. He uh, didn't want, he didn't like his previous SDK. So we treated him with an oral uh, dose of steroid. The thing that's interesting is that he's got intermediate uveitis, he had undergone a vitrectomy in his right eye. His vitreous was removed, and that eye has remained completely quiet since then. His left eye, which has, did not undergo a vitrectomy, has had few but a couple of flares over the years. So there may be something important to therapeutic vitrectomy. So PFAPA, you know, it's the most common auto-inflammatory fever uh, uh, disorder of childhood, usually before the age of five. Episodes of fever uh, with one of the three, aphostomatitis, pharyngitis, cervical adenitis, every three weeks. Um, it is thought to be, you know, a defect of the adaptive immune system, uh, uh, mediated by inflammasomes that recruit T cells usually resolves spontaneously by the second decade. So we reported this as the first case of intermediate EBS associated with this syndrome. And uh, there have been other reports since then. So pediatric intermediate EBS, okay, the second most common non-infectious EBS uh, that, that we see. Epidemiology, just a couple of factoids, you know, 
Uh, it's fairly common, uh, first and fourth decades. Most of the time it's bilateral, but not infrequently, you know, asymmetric, right? With a third presenting unilaterally. Okay, uh, there's no inheritance pattern, but there seems to be a little clustering. Clinical features, uh, as opposed to adults with anterior segment with uh, intermediate guys, there seems to be a more exuberant anterior segment component in children with intermediate guys. At least that's been my experience. The other thing is that not infrequently children will present with lots of inflammation, right retrolenticularly behind their lens, which I think is probably related to their peripheral to inflammation in the peripheral retina. So you see these kind of big swaths of inflammatory material behind their lens. In fact. They're referred sometimes in, but they have a cataract when in fact they have inflammatory material behind their, behind their lens. The tritus, as you know, is the sine qua non of uh, too many uveitis with collections of inflammatory debris, uh, vitreous opacities. Here you can see, I have a slit lamp photograph of you know, the two or three plus cell plus the snowballs. Uh, retinal vasculitis is pretty uh, common. What vessels are mostly affected arteries or veins, phlebitis or arteritis, or both. Anyway. So it's actually an important distinction. It's mostly phlebitis. Okay? <coughs> arteritis, you'd be thinking about other diseases like ARN. Okay? <coughs> so you can see vascular occlusion and peripheral ischemia, or as we'll see in the next slide, uh, um, you know, uh, a ferning pattern. Maybe vascularization is, uh, can occur in the peripheral retina and the optic nerve, okay? But it's important to know if that neovascularization is due to ischemia or through inflammation because the treatment would be different, right? Interestingly, uh, about, you know, a quarter of children can actually present, you know, with vitreous hemorrhage, okay? Whereas about three percent of adults, over, uh, or six percent of adults, five percent with vitreous hemorrhage. Um, so that's an important presenting sign to be thinking about. And macular edema is a common cause of decreased vision. Uh, I just show this uh, mont this montage uh, on the left hand side. You see this kind of peripheral leakage. This that is classic, called a ferning type of pattern that you might see patients with intermediate uveitis, but you can also have, uh, you know, peripheral non-perfusion. So I think that the disease is uh, one of uh, a vasculitis in the peripheral retina, mostly, and uh, the peripheral non-perfusion can give rise to ischemia and neovascularization, okay? Uh, patients, I have had several patients that have presented, for example, with Neovascularization of the disc, and after doing an angiogram in the patient, there is no, there are no non-perfusion defects, and those patients seem to respond extremely well to anti-inflammatory therapy without laser. So you can avoid the destructive effects of laser or even an anti-VEGF treatment um, by doing an angiogram, seeing if there's ischemia. So differential diagnosis of pediatric intermediate EVIs is similar to that in adults, okay? MS is a little more common, Lyme, cat scratch, toxo, sarcoid, et cetera. So you rule out an infectious disease, okay? And um, if it's, there is no systemic or infectious association, it is called, and there is a snowbank, parthenitis, right? So parthenitis is the idiopathic variant of intermediate EBIs. Complications. I think we <coughs> don't really need to belabor this. Uh, this the asterisks are have to do with a study that we performed here, uh, where cataract was actually quite common. Uh, macular edema, ocular hypertension was was common in our group. Band keratopathy. Uh, retinal detachment can occur uh, either due to tractional retinal detachment in the periphery or due to retinoschisis which is see, seen not uncommonly in patients with uh, intermediate UVI. It's about between, it's reported between 15 and 20% of patients. And it's thought 
to be either due to ischemia or to peripheral traction. Uh, and usually, uh, it does not progress. Usually. Okay? One can uh, have uh, disc edema, neovascularization, as we mentioned, in vitreous hemorrhage you know, as a presenting sign, 28% versus 6%. And of course, amblyopia. Treatment and prognosis similar in, as in JAA. You know, you want to treat early and aggressively in patients that present younger, right, who are at risk for amblyopia. They already have structural complications. Okay, uh, extensive vasculitis, irrespective of you know visual acuity, and uh, significant vitreous cell, uh, cell, and then a modified step level. And I put this up there only because it's an open question. Uh, you, you use topical and periocular steroids you know, judiciously and then systemic corticosteroids, but one underutilized modality <coughs> that's in the literature is cryopexy and indirect laser. It was initially described for patients with peripheral neovascularization, but um, there have been some other states, at least in adults and not in children, that show that um, renal cryotherapy reduces uh, or in increases the risk of remission by fourfold uh, in patients undergoing cryotherapy. And then whether or not you treat patients with immunomodulatory therapy versus vitrectomy is, a, is an open question in terms of you know what's the next <coughs> approach. And there are pros and cons to both of which, which we could discuss for a long, long time. Okay, And I think that there are certainly situations in which you would want to do vitrectomy. For example, if a patient has a structural complication or Hemorrhage. Uh, I'm not so sure that um, vitrectomy, as first before immunomodulation, is is better than immunomodulation and vitrectomy. That's an open question. However, we did look at immunosuppression in the treatment of pediatric EDS in our group of patients, and we found that it was pretty well tolerated, very well tolerated. Uh, using combination of both antimetabolites and uh, uh, biological agents. In, uh, and in, among the uh, 30, 20 of the 39 patients, <coughs> 19 of the 20 were able to be tapered off with steroids completely. Okay? So that's, I, I think, huge for pediatric UBS. Okay? And 75% of these uh, were inactive at their last follow-up. Alternatively, Steve Foster and his group uh, actually looked at uh, vitrectomy for uh, patients with uh, refractory intermediate EVIs. Again, this is a small group of eyes, uncontrolled series, which showed 96% of inflammatory control, unspecified follow-up, um, you know, uh, uh, in patients that had poor inflammatory control, um, and that Five, six of these patients had persistent retinal vasculitis, which we know is difficult to treat. So vitrectomy may contribute to the control of, you know, recalcitrant inflammation in intermediate EBIs in that sub, in that subgroup. Just for your information, uh, and it may come up in another mole, uh, that vitrectomy uh, has also been shown, at least in the site study, uh, to increase uh, the rate of a disease-free remission uh, among patients with intermediate EDIs by, I think, two, two and a half fold. So it's an open area for study, but it's, it's a hard one to control for. All right, congenital infections. We kind of touch on this. Do we want to list them real quickly, someone? Yes. Torches? So others. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There are some others here. Rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes. Toxo is the most important one, okay? Um, as a congenital infection. I think for board purposes, you know, you need to know that the transmission is directly associated and the severity is inversely associated related to gestational age. And that 40% of primary maternal infections result in congenital disease, and 
at 70% of them manifest with ocular uh, lesions in it, and a third of them are in the macula, unfortunately. Okay, so the classic triad of congenital toxoplasmosis is chororetinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications, as you can see here, sub of the child. Well, this is like 40% primary maternal infections result in congenital disease. Um, is that like for moms that have not ever gotten toxic before? Is this the first time they've gotten toxic during pregnancy? They're just, they're, or can they like? just if you have, if you're pregnant and you get toxoplasmosis, you have a 40% chance of, of vertical transmission of the fetus. So, I'm just wondering if you have like some protection, like, doesn't like most people have like, have, have had exposure to it, so they have like, yeah. some protection to it? Yeah. Active toxic. So that's why you know they advise women to stay away from litter boxes. And, but there's kind of a paradigm shift in the thinking of congenital toxoplasmosis, right? And, and that there's pretty good evidence that about two thirds of them actually may represent uh, postnatal uh, infection. So that prevention strategies should be targeted not only, you know, for women uh, you know, to prevent them from becoming infected, but also children from, you know, eating. Of course, uh, the problem is that there can be a subclinical infection with posterior involvement in a very high percentage of patients. Okay, eighty-five percent of patients develop chororetinitis after three point seven years. Seven percent blind in one or both eyes. So the diagnosis is made um, clinically, but uh, serology is important diagnosis of congenital toxoplasmosis with the presence of IgM or IgA in congenital infection, and then of course acquired disease in the adult. IgG, as you know, crosses the placenta. Treatment indications for congenital disease, what, what would you recommend for a child that is diagnosed with toxoplasmosis? So it's important to know that any child that is diagnosed with congenital toxoplasmosis receives chronic antiparasitic therapy, usually with triple therapy, for a year. Okay? Because of the fact that uh, whether or not they have lesions or not, you know, a very high percentage of them will develop lesions over time. Uh, treatment in, the indications for treatment in older children are similar to that in adults. You know what those are, right, guys? Okay, lesions threaten the magda optic nerve, usually it's a different detritus. And then, of course, immunocompromised post requires maintenance and prophylaxis. Okay. The treatment regimens, I'm not going to go through, though, we will go through this. Um, you know, I think, I think Akbar will probably go through these uh, next week. Okay, but there's the, you know, classical triple therapy. Uh, with corticosteroids, if they're significant for it's usually at a reduced dose. Um, and then there are alternatives, such as the addition of clindamycin. Bactrim is also used uh, for patients with peripheral lesions. There's azithromycin, a topoclone. And then intravitreal therapy with dexamethasone, particularly for patients with, with foveal threatening lesions and in pregnant women who cannot take these medications. Uh, and uh, there is another, I don't know, board type of thing. What other, if, if another board thing that is totally useless that sometimes comes up on questions is, you know, spiromycin is a macrolide antibiotic that has been used effectively and safely in pregnant women who have toxoplasmosis. It is not available in the United States. Okay, so others in the torch group that you may or may not be aware of. Can you think of others that we haven't mentioned that might be similar to toxoplasmosis, for example? You may not know about this, okay? This is what it looks like. So it kind of looks like a toxolation, right? Chlororetinal scar here. And if you know who this guy is, anyway, uh, the other one. So anybody know what band that is? So 
that's a great event, and uh, that's Bob Weir, often called The Other One, and uh, anyhow, I uh, had a song called The Other One, which is kind of a classic. Anyway, so The Others, okay, lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus is something that you might want to know something about, okay? Single-stranded RNA uh, virus produces a symptomatic maternal illness in two-thirds of the cases, vertically transmitted during uh, uh, episodes of maternal viremia, it's diagnosed serology and by um, Western blot. The systemic findings um, are that of macrocephaly, hydrocephalus, intracranial calcifications, and neurologic abnormalities, but phenotypically, it looks very, very similar to toxoplasmosis and is distinguished from toxoplasmosis, not so much by the lesions in the back of the eye, but serologically and the pattern of intracranial calcifications, which are more paraventricularly located in LCMV. There's another emerging infection that was very important in the last three, two or three years that looked like this, that produces congenital infections, but also produces a congenital syndrome, which is pretty awful. Everybody know what that is? Zika, right? So, I think it's important to know that Zika viruses uh, can produce these kind of colobomatous um, corneal atrophic changes. It's a single-stranded RNA flavi virus. The Aedes mosquito is the vector. It can produce a mild flu-like illness, but it can, in congenital diseases, it can produce macular coloboma and uh, tor torpedo maculopathy, hemorrhagic retinopathy, optic nerve hypophagia. Okay, and it is uh, can be diagnosed by reverse transcriptase PCR, you know, the blood and urine, which of course is not widely available to where it is most prevalent, right? Okay, four-year-old child, painless unilateral decreased vision and strabismus. And that's what you're looking at. What's the diagnosis? Oxo plot. Okay. What else? Toxocara. Pink toxocara. Very good. Toxocariasis. Okay. So that's our toxocariasis occurs in kids with a history of pica contact with puppies. There are two types of toxocariasis, right? Visceral uh, multiple migrants, which occurs in a younger age and is associated with peripheral eosinophilia, whereas ocular uh, uh, larval migrants uh, is older with no eosinophilia and is diagnosed on ophthalmoscopy. It's unilateral in 90%. There are three different presentations that you that are important to know about. Okay? So this is a posterior pole granuloma. Okay? There is another type where there is a peripheral granuloma, which is frequently associated with fractional band uh, to the optic nerve. I think this also has that on examination. And then in older children, there is an endophthalmitis presentation. The diagnosis is clinical with supportive serology. It is important to perform an ultrasound, and in some cases in which the diagnosis is difficult, ELISA can be helpful in the sense of CDC. So the differential diagnosis, again, of toxicariasis is really important. What would be your number one differential diagnosis for toxicariasis? Retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma. Okay, good. Okay. You also need to think, sometimes these eyes can be very, very inflamed. Um, and also, other, other than um, retinoblastoma, uh, infectious, other infectious pro processes, as toxoplasmosis was mentioned before, and then retinovascular, uh, congenital retinovascular processes, such as ROP and fever, right, with these kind of fractional bands coming from the periphery to the optic nerve. The tr there is no uniformly satisfactory treatment for this. Uh, some people do use anti-helminthic treatment for systemic disease, like with albendazole, but uh, for the ocular complications, we usually treat steroids. 
uh, and uh, vitroretinal surgery for the complications of the disease. This is another interesting case that kind of walked in on a Friday. A uh, 15-year-old woman that we saw actually recently in our clinic uh, with congenital CMV with a two-week history of uh, photophobia and blurred vision. Okay? Her past medical history was significant with congenital CMV, hearing loss, and developmental delay. Okay? She had a, quote, panuveitis in her dull eye with subsequent retinal detachment and repair and vision loss. So she's unilateral, comes in with visual complaint in her fellow eye. Okay, so her uh, right eye was LP. Let's see a picture of that. And her left eye, 2060, normal pressure, cells in her AC, and cells in her vitreous. This is what her right eye looked like. That should kind of get your attention, right? Looking at the other eye sometimes helps you, you know, uh, think about what you could possibly be dealing with in the other eye, right? So we see here, you know, a, an eye that, you know, had significant inflammation, has epiretinal and subretinal fibrosis, right? And is semi-attached, okay? With um, what looks like uh, remnants of still vitreous over the optic nerve. The fellow eye has this kind of whitish lesion superiorly, okay? And then there's some other stuff going on peripherally, as you can see here. Anybody want to hazard a, see anything going on in the peripheral retina of the side? It's not an artifact. There are a few hypoacusant spots in the inferiorly. It looks like there could be subretinal fluid. You can see any peripheral retinal whitening. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know if it projects so well, but there's a little bit of retinal vasculitis too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have panuveitis, retinal vasculitis, papillitis, and retinitis in the left eye. Okay. A history of retinal detachment in the fellow eye, which may clue you into maybe something that's going on in the active eye. Previous labs were, you know, fairly unremarkable. So, what are you thinking about here? Repetitive. What can what can destroy an eye in a week? Arn. Arn. Okay. So, a necrotizing retinitis, exactly. Anything else? So, can arn occur in kids? Definitely. Okay, so thinking about infectious disease, if, you know, infection can, uh, can, uh, can ruin an eye, right? Necrotizing can affect your eyes. And of course, the usual suspects, right? Uh, I thought possibly there could be a metastatic endophthalmitis or toxo lesion in that one, one area. Non infectious disease, you know. This is uh, for academic purposes. I don't think that she had this. So this is which is what she kind of looks like. Next step, what is you, we've got the what is a clinical diagnosis? I think you have it. Necrotizing retinitis. She's got cells in her AC, cells in her vitreous, peripheral retinal right whitening. What would be the next step? So that's, we did the EY, okay? And we actually, uh, she had undergone some laboratory workup, but she did have a, a AC tap and injection of gancyclovir and Foscarin, and she was positive for BCD. So confirming the diagnosis of ARN, okay? Initial treatment, what would, she's a young kid, she's developmentally delayed, what would you do? Send her home? Yeah. Send her home with, for IV yeah. antivirals, acyclovir. Exactly, that's, that's exactly right. So we admitted her IV antipsychlovir, uh, and then, uh, you know, transitioned her. She received several additional injections, and 
that we placed her on uh, prednisone shortly after we started her on antibiotic medication. She received a laser barricade to the temporal retina. Given her history of retinal detachment in her other eye, as we know in arm, you know, 75 percent of the patients can develop retinal detachment, right? And in a young eye in which the vitreous is attached, you know, you're playing with fire. Okay, so. Okay, so there's no randomized controlled data that says that you know laser barricade is indicated. So, uh, but I think it's pretty low risk and uh, you know potentially uh, protective. Uh, so, six years later, she's still 2025, 20, doing great, and she's on prophylactic, uh, you know, valve uh, isoprevir. Uh, Again, Akbar will probably go over this, but you know there are criteria that, uh, for the diagnosis of necrotizing retinitis, and it's really a clinical diagnosis. Okay, we get uh, PCR confirmation. Uh, PCR isn't always confirmative. You go with your clinical gut, I think. So retinal necrosis, rapid progression without treatment, circumferential spread, occlusive vasculopathy usually with arterial involvement, and prominent inflammatory reaction. So she met these criteria. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why people with ARN lose vision okay, is not only from retinal detachment uh, and vitreous, but it's also optic nerve uh, infiltration from herpes. So they can develop an optic neuropathy and, uh, and lose vision permanently. Why did you do anterior chamber tap <laughs> instead of vitreous tap? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because I was pretty convinced that my differential diagnosis was pretty narrow. And it was what? It was a narrow differential diagnosis. And the yield from the AC tap uh, was, is, is pretty good. And it was less morbid for that particular child. Uh, we would have done it. And I, we wanted to see you know, what her what she looked like under anesthesia. So it was pretty convincing that it was arm. Right. Okay. So you, it, you were pretty sure of her that you will get like a positive something herpetic from the AC plus the kid's vitreous is pretty solid. So it's more like dramatic and you might not get what you need. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I completely heard your question. Uh, sorry. Like, I, so when, like, when you say that your differential was narrow plus um, AC tap is less traumatic, you mean you're looking for something like herpetic or VZB, so you right. were pretty sure you'd get your positive result plus the kid's vitreous is pretty solid, so it's more traumatic and you're not going to get a positive result? Is that what you Yeah, mean? so I think that the yield is pretty good for an AC tap for, for ARN. Uh, and like in, in the clinic, if a patient comes in with a clinical diagnosis of ARN, they have no other, uh, you know, contravening uh, factors. Um, they don't have any other risk factors, not immunosuppressed. You're not thinking of, a, you know, endogenous endophthalmitis or other infectious disease. I would perform an AC tap and inject them and get them treated because my clinical impression, because I'm making a clinical diagnosis of ARN, if I'm thinking that it's more, it could be ARN, but it could also be syphilis, or it could also be toxoplasmosis, I mean, that area could have been, I guess, toxoplasmosis, but it wasn't, she was an immunosuppressed toxoplasmosis where you couldn't really make a differential. So I, it was a clinical call. And I mean, vitreous biopsy is not that big a deal, okay? I, you know, but in a pure lost her other eye, so we wanted to minimize complication. And in, at EUA, we were pretty convinced that she had harm. That's a good question. Okay, 12-year-old from Idaho, unilateral recurrent multifocal cardiorental inflammatory episodes with scant vitreous. Talking about this yesterday. You see anything in that area that? Yeah. 
So, in, in, in the air that's not highlighted, what do you see? So let's just, this is, this is kind of like, you know, patients don't present like that, right? Okay. But what do you see other than the area that's highlighted in the retina? Is it normal? What was that? Is the retina normal? Do you see anything in the, in the, uh, well, in the, like, in the RPE or? Periphery, it looks like there's Perfect, like right. hypopigmented yeah. lesions. You see multifocal kind of cortex, right? Mm. And what do you see in the highlighted area? Like S shaped hypopigmented track lesion. <laughs> it's like a, I don't know, an arm <laughs> sign or something. Okay. Uh, an S shaped <laughs> something. So this is due, okay, there's a worm there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, turn on the light. Another one, another one. There So we know that Dusen is our nematode infection. It can be caused, they were initially described, you know, uh, toxotyrant can cause this, but uh, it's, you know, caused by these uh, nematode infections the, uh, associated with uh, phalioscorus, uh, which is a, you know, seen in raccoons and skunks in North and Midwest and Canada, and then Ankylosacanium uh, dog hookworm. This is what it looks like on EM. Usually it presents with unilateral, recurrent, focal, multifocal, and diffuse inflammation of the retina pigment epithelium. So early differential diagnosis. Early in the disease, <coughs> you, you get faked up. These are white dot syndromes, okay? So this is another case, okay, of a, of Dusen that looked like a white dot syndrome but the arrow is pointing to a curled up worm. Okay. Later, as we saw yesterday, we were thinking about you know, differential diagnosis of RP. So that's why you know, I think Akbar and I were thinking throwing out uh, <coughs> as a differential because in the end stages of this can so treatment, what's the treatment for Dusen? Laser it. Burn the worm, right. Laser the worm. And there, sometimes it can be difficult to laser the worm because they move uh, and they are phototropic. You know, you shine a light on them and then they run into the shadows. Uh, there is <laughs> some, some uh, thought that maybe treating patients with albendazole may, may get the worm you know, stoned or something, and uh, they'll get, you know, slow down and make it easier to, to burn the worm. <laughs> and, uh, there's no, uh, there's no danger in terms of inducing loss of inflammation in the eye after uh, treating the patient with laser. So, you guys are not infrequently called, okay, to see pediatric patients, right? Uh, for endogenous bacterial and fungal infections, right? So, you guys see this? Does that look familiar to any of you? Do you ever see this when you're called on consults? So usually in immunologi immunologically immature neonates and hospitalized kids or those on immunosuppression. Here's the same thing, a little higher magnification. Retinal uh, infiltrate with hemorrhage. What would
would be your clinical diagnosis of this? What group of organisms? Well, what could it be? Fungal. Fungal? What else could it be? Viral. Viral could, could be. In kids? Uh, yeah, not that common. Because, I mean, the kids in the ICU, you know, got the lines in and everything else. Febrile. They could have a bacterial infection, right? Okay. So, important pathogens, candida, you know, pseudomonas, staph, strep, mophilus, less commonly Neisseria meningitis. Most of the time, you know, you, you will be, when you are called to see these patients, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they will tell you this child has an underlying, you know, infection. We want you to rule out, you know, uh, auger involvement, okay? Okay, uh, and I, I think that uh, a lot of the time it's not, it's not always that easy a call. And then what do you do when, uh, when, when do you treat them? You know, uh, these, when do you treat them for their ocular disease? And for candida, I think uh, there's good evidence to suggest that the lesions themselves, the candida, unless they have broken through into the vitreous and producing vitreous can be managed with systemic therapy, right? Without intravitreal injection or with, with vitrectomy. But what if you have you don't have an extraocular focus or an underlying systemic condition and no signs of inflammation. Again, retinoblastoma. Okay? You don't want to miss retinoblastoma. Okay? So in a patient with retinoblastoma, there would be no apparent signs of infection, right? Maybe pseudo A Eight-year-old female presents with unilateral painless decreased vision in the right eye History of cervical adenopathy, mild fever, and she has a new pet. And that's that. That's the uh, endoscopic examination. Chris, what are, what is this? Describe what you see. What's that? I would say this could be Bartonella. You would say it's Bartonella. I mean, what? I, that's a, that's a possible etiology, but what do you what do you actually describe it? Neuroretinitis. Right, neuroretinitis. Okay, exactly. And what makes it neuroretinitis? Looks like you have something with a capillitis, and then um, there's a decrease in macular star. Right. So there's a partial macular star on the side. Right. Okay. So neuroretinitis. Neuroretinitis uh, doesn't necessarily have to be Bartonella, right? It can be many things, okay? Infectious disease, Bartonella is the most common cause of neuroretinitis, no question about it, okay? However, all of these other pathogens can produce potential neuroretinitis, right? Syphilis, Lyme, Dusen, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, okay? Uh, then you can have what was initially described as Labor's idiopathic uh, stellate maculopathy back in 1916. So there's an idiopathic variety of this. Uh, many people think that maybe Labor was describing Bartonella, but there's no way to know that. There is idiopathic the recurrent attacks. And uh, there are other, other retinal diseases that can look like neuroretinitis, like Irvine. Also produce a macular star, and then uh, non-infectious causes such as sarcoid and polyuretinous nodosis and inflammatory bowel disease. So, cast crutch disease uh, most commonly uh, three species cause ocular disease. There are seven of them. Okay, Bartonella hensleyi, Quintana, and Bacilliformis. Uh, the highest, you know, we see this mostly in, in kids and in the southern United States in late fall. Uh, Asking, the, asking for extraocular manifestations is helpful in establishing the diagnosis. Most have a flu, preceding flu-like illness and regional adenopathy, okay, and an erythematous 
papule inoculation site of, of the cat scratch. Okay, I disseminated infection and had fever, myalgias, splenomegaly, and encephalitis. Um, ocular disease, we know there's Parnod's ocular glandular syndrome, neuroretinitis, and importantly, retin you know, the macular star, but importantly, it can also produce a multifocal retinal cortex. Okay. So Bartonella can, can actually have multiple manifestations in the eye. Okay. It can also produce uh, uh, vascular occlusive disease. Um, it is clinical diagnosis with confirmatory serology, broad differential, as we mentioned. And then there are really no definitive guidelines for cat scratch disease because the um, uh, natural history of this disease is actually very favorable with you know, a very high percentage of patients recovering excellent visual acuity. But if it does, uh, if it does require treatment, doxycycline uh, in children that are older than seven or eight years old, you know, um, Cipro, Isithro, and Lecanthin can be used. Um, I think maybe one or two final cases. 16-year-old uh, with bilateral blurred vision floaters, vitritis, and snowballs. We don't see a whole hell of a lot of this. Hikers with, she's a hiker with a photograph of a rash. You should be able to make this diagnosis by looking at this. What, what are you looking at? Someone describe this rash. The dermatologist in the room. Targetoid. Targetoid, okay. So it's a targetoid, but what is it called? Yeah. Arathema migrans. Okay. So it's a targetoid rash of, uh, that's associated with Lyme disease. She recently relocated from the East Coast. Okay. Lyme disease, as you know, is uh, you know, tick-borne disease from the, uh, the deer tick. Uh, it is endemic into the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states. My colleagues in New York uh, say that they see actually a lot of this. Um, we participated in a study in terms of Lyme testing here and really found that there was, it was the positive predictive value of Lyme testing is very, very, very poor without you know, uh, a history. Only 25% of patients recall a tick bite Systemic stages of the disease are similar to that of syphilis, okay, with an early disseminated and persistent phase, and the uh, systemic manifestations of this disease um, are uh, depend upon the stage of the disease. So, early in the disease, you have erythema migrans. That's diagnostic, okay, right there. Disseminated uh, fever, meningitis, Bell's palsy. I got a call from my mother-in-law. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, saying that she, the side of her face was drooping and she was going to see her general practitioner. She lives in New Jersey. And I said, really? Make sure they do a Lyme titer. And that's exactly what she had. She had Lyme disease. So, you know, uh, facial palsy is, is not uncommon. And then persistent, it can be really problematic, okay, with arthritis and neurological syndromes. The ocular manifestation depends upon the stage of disease with uh, follicular conjunctivitis uh, being most common early, and intermediate uveitis, with, which is the more common presentation of the disseminated or persistent disease, but one can also see posterior uveitis, although I have never seen that personally, um, and then keratitis in the persistent stage of the disease. The diagnosis is uh, with ELISA and with uh, Western blot confirmation, and the differential diagnosis, of course, in children and, and in older people is JIA and intermediate. Again, treated uh, depending upon the stage of the disease with uh, oral antibiotics or with the sound disease of IV uh, antibiotics at neurological doses. Finally, uh, masquerade syndromes, we've touched on this. Someone described this unusual looking hypopion. It's mixed with heme. Yeah, so so called pink hypopion, right? Mixed with hemorrhage. So, what would that make you think about? Now, I mean, we have masquerade syndromes on there, okay? So certainly, what masquerade syndrome would you think of? Herpetic. What's that? Herpetic. 
Okay. The herpetic is definitely in the differential diagnosis, for sure. But what other masquerade syndromes would you think about? Uh, xanthogranuloma. Excellent. Okay, usually that doesn't present with hypopia, but what does that present with? Hyphema. Hyphema and nodule, right? Okay, and elevated intraocular pressure. So elevated intraocular pressure, hyphema, nodule, think about it. Juvenile xanthogranuloma. I was trying to get at uh, acute leukemia is usually, uh, rather than chronic leukemia, is will produce a pink hypopia in these eyes. Cole, what's the other diagnosis? Retinoblastoma. Uh, okay, retinoblastoma. <laughs> Mariana, you know, uh, J JXG for sure, and ophthalmitis, post transplant lymph proliferative disorder. Uh, can you track your foreign body? So modifying the prognosis, you know, early diagnosis in kids is critical. Effective suppression of intraocular inflammation, appropriate antibiotic cover if you think you're dealing with an infection. The early use of uh, steroid spring immunomodulation, particularly in children with chronic diseases like GIA. And then identifying eyes at risk for complications, right? So patients with GIA that present with posterior sneakia are at risk for further complications and our surrogate markers for poorer prognoses. We didn't discuss other things like laser, laser photophotometry. Uh, there is a suggestion to reassess the current screening guidelines, and then mutant post-marketing surveillance of randomized controlled trials uh, for the safety and efficacy of new and biological therapies. That's the end. Those are my kids.